My name is Martin Bryant, and uh, I'm from The Next Web, and uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, pitching your startup to the media, because uh, in my job, uh, I get uh, a lot of pitches uh, from uh, startups looking for press, looking for coverage, and uh, through all those email inbox pitches and all those conversations, uh, certainly uh, built up quite a few tips over the years. So. Uh, First of all, just a little bit of an explanation about The Next Web, for anyone who's not familiar with it. Uh, the Next Web is a technology news website. Uh, we cover news uh, from uh, everything from the smallest startup, uh, just launching its first product, right through to the latest moves by Google, Twitter, Facebook, Microsoft, Apple, all those big companies, with a healthy dose of kind of internet culture thrown in there as well. Uh, we are a little different to a lot of our competitors. A lot of our competitors will maybe just focus on the US, or just focus on Silicon Valley, or maybe just a, an individual country or city around the world. Uh, what we try to do is really have a global approach. So we have staff in Asia, in uh, Europe, in the US, and uh, between us, uh, we uh, cover the whole world, uh, have a rolling virtual newsroom uh, that through the week uh, covers news from right around the world. That means, though, that we do get pitches from pretty much every country, um, everywhere, every, all the places you'd expect, and lots of uh, other small places that you'd never expect startups to be based, but uh, it does mean you get a huge variety of pitches. So, uh, well, let's get into it. Uh, we're gonna start off uh, just looking at before you pitch, and uh, your approach to uh, thinking about the pitch itself. So uh, the first question is, are you ready? Are you actually ready? Uh, is your product ready? Um, because uh, believe it or not, some people, especially if they've just got their first product, it, it may not be even at a minimal uh, viable product state, minimum viable product stage. Uh, they haven't got their MVP. Uh, and uh, that can basically mean that it's a wasted pitch. Uh, so many people will come to us and say, will you cover our new app? Yeah, sure, can I try it out? It's not ready for three months, but it's really exciting. Will you cover it? Uh, no, we'll cover it when it's ready because basically, if it's not ready for your users, it's not ready for the press. Uh, our readers really do expect that if we're writing about something, they can go straight away and uh, click through, try it out, download it, um, or at least join some kind of private beta to, uh, to uh, try it out in the very near future. Uh, so uh, make sure you do have something to actually show us. Uh, next thing is, do you have an angle? Uh, because uh, what some people don't necessarily understand about the startup press is, uh, or indeed any press really, is that we are storytellers. Uh, it might seem like, oh, you're just writing about apps and things. Uh, but uh, we really do want to tell stories and package it into something that uh, helps set the scene and help um, explain uh, the story of the company, of the app, where it's going, all of that. So uh, having an angle is a really useful um, useful way of doing that. Uh, the uh, most common thing, uh, especially for new companies, new apps, new products, is that you've just launched or you're about to launch. Uh, in most cases, it will be just launched. And so what I'd say for this is if you've got something you're about to launch, uh, contact us maybe two or three days before and uh, tell us we're about to launch this, uh, give us some advanced access so we can try it out before it launches, and then basically the minute you launch, or at least the day you launch, uh, if we really like it, we can run something. Uh, if you are already really, really big, uh, or, or you know, there's already a lot of interest in you, then the about to launch thing might work. But as I said before, generally, it's more about uh, um, you know, having things that users can try right away. So uh, the, the just launch thing is uh, very useful. A major new feature, if you're already out there, you're already established, then uh, having something new that really takes your product forward in a meaningful way uh, is what we're talking about there. Um, what I don't mean here uh, is uh, sometimes uh, we'll get people pitching us and maybe they've had lots of press already about something in the past and so I'll say to them, well wait until, please come back to us when you've got something new, something that takes your product forward in some meaningful way. And I'll go, okay. Then two weeks later, I get an email from them saying, hi, you said you wanted to change something new? Well, uh, we've just rewritten the text on our homepage. Can you imagine the uh, article I could write about that? Startup you've never heard of rewrites text on homepage. Not exactly uh, compelling reading uh, for uh, our audience. 
So, uh, yes, uh, so what we uh, do instead is uh, we do want to look for uh, major features. So if it's like something like uh, um, you're a, a, a photography app that's added video or you're you know, you, you were free, but now you've released a, a premium offering that can be, uh, can be bought. That kind of thing, something that really takes your product forward. Another option is a significant milestone. So uh, you uh, have reached a million users in two days or something. You know, <laughs> something that's really exciting, that really shows uh, some kind of uh, real uh, pace and momentum to your story. Uh, uh, I got told recently, this, this is quite a good one um, from a startup last week, uh, they are a competitor to Instagram. And uh, they, they've always been one of the more popular competitors to Instagram, but whereas Instagram's right up there on a usership graph, uh, this particular app would maybe be down here, which just shows how far ahead Instagram is, even if, if you listen to some people, interest is maybe waning a little in that respect. Uh, they, what they did was they found suddenly that this, uh, without them really trying to do anything, this high school in Texas started using the app, completely out of the blue, just started using the app. Um, just a, a group of friends at this school, and it went viral around the school, and then it went viral with their friends and their network, and it all started from this high school in Texas. And uh, so usership numbers for them are, are through the roof. And uh, that's an interesting story of momentum, and it's got like a, an interesting angle to it. So, so that's quite an interesting story. Uh, all those kind of usership increase, and you know, um, oh, you know, we've got 200,000 dollars of revenue and things. They're not always interesting to readers, but uh, certainly pictures with them. And the other thing is human interest. Uh, if, if you've got a really interesting story about that's people related, that can be a really useful angle as well. Um, an example of this is uh, um, I listen to a lot of podcasts by uh, the American uh, broadcaster Leo Laporte, and uh, he talks about one of his sponsors. And uh, um, he was uh, when, when he does his like ads for his sponsors during his shows, he was talking about one where uh, the um, uh, the, um, the recent hurricane that went up um, at the east coast of the US, um, it caused a big flood in the offices of this company, and they were um, they had a big chain of people down the stairs with buckets of water to make sure the servers didn't get wet and to make sure the, uh, uh, the service continued. In the immediate aftermath after that hurricane, that might have been an interesting story because it was relevant, it was newsy, it was uh, related to something that was happening now, and it was an interesting story about how they had to work really hard um, in a really kind of physical, unexpected way to work. Uh, keep the service running. So that might have worked as a pitch. So uh, you've got your angle, you've got your product. Um, next thing is to pick someone relevant to contact. Uh, now that might, may sound uh, obvious, but at the same time you might think, well if I contact the wrong person, surely they'll just forward it on to the right person. Doesn't always happen. In a dream world it, it certainly would, and in an ideal situation it would. Uh, so if you are a music app, you probably want to contact our apps editor or our media editor. We actually have someone who is an apps and media editor, so that's, that's quite useful. Uh, but if you, if you did contact, I don't know, our, our, our Latin America editor um, for a, a music app, then maybe that wouldn't be uh, the right thing to do, um, because uh, maybe they would be really, really busy and in an ideal world they, would, they, well, they would forward it onto the right person within the organization. But when they've got 100 pitches, they're at a conference, uh, they come back to their computer, they already have 200 emails, uh, they may well just delete it because it's, it's irrelevant to them at that moment. Um, so uh, yeah, pick the right person, easiest way to do that. Just look through the site and find um, who uh, writes about your kind of app and uh, they uh, may well be the right person to contact. Um, one of our team did a, uh, an interview um, on the site Mixergy um, last year or the year before and uh, he said, for example, uh, Martin Bryant really likes location apps, so, and I hate them, so pitch Martin with your location apps. Literally, that Mixergy gets tons of traffic, and I got so many location-based app uh, pitches as a result of that. Uh, so it can go a bit overloaded in that way, but uh, I do still like location-based apps, by the way, even though the novelty's worn off there. 
So now we get to making the actual pitch. Uh, making uh, th this is um, the the part that is actually a, a real minefield. Uh, this is where things can go uh, really, really wrong um, if, if you go about it the wrong way. Um, which sounds horrible, really, because it, it sounds like journalists are like really horrible, evil people who want to want to see you fail and uh, want to get tripped up by your your mistakes. But uh, I want to trip you up with your mistakes. But uh, um, like I say, we handle a lot and a lot of pitches, so uh, approaching it the right way really, really helps. Uh, if you were here last year and saw me give a, a similar talk, um, these slide, these next three slides are actually from uh, last year, uh, but uh, they're still really relevant. Um, if you kind of Uh, there we go. Oh, we don't have one there. Uh, yeah. So uh, these pi these uh, these slides are uh, a little bit. The text a bit small, but um, I'll I'll just pick out a few things. Basically, uh, because we have staff right around the world, we organise our. Uh, our, our, all our operations uh, through a service called uh, Convo, uh, which we all log into when we, when we start in the morning. And uh, so on there, I basically asked, uh, what are your pet hates when it comes to being pitched stories? And uh, as you can see, um, the team immediately uh, chipped in with loads and loads of ideas. Uh, I'll go into some of these in a bit more detail uh, shortly, but... Uh, um, <laughs> One of them, um, email, then call me five minutes later to verify that I got your email. Uh, you know, no need for that. Um, it's kind of like, you know, real kind of pestering about it. You know, if you've sent the email, we'll get to it. Um, dear potential media outlet, so completely lacking any kind of personalization at all at the start of the email. Uh, you know, we know it's practical to send emails out in bulk, but uh, it, it certainly is a bit more engaging to receive something that uh, um, is, is a bit more personal. Um, uh, dear the next, uh, <laughs> dear the next read write web, get the name right. I've had so many pitches saying, I'm sure Mashable would love to cover this. I'm like, yeah, I'm sure Mashable would, but I'm not from Mashable, so why are you telling me that? Um, uh, and uh, that's just really bad copying and pasting and not double checking before you hit send. The list went on. Um, uh, emailing both my personal and work accounts with the same pitch. Yes, that, that, that is annoying. Um, copying, my, <laughs> copying and pasting my name in a different font. Uh, yeah, so uh, you, you got the name right, but it just looks like you've just pasted it in. Um, it, it just doesn't look very good. Um, story suggestions, as if I can't spin something up uh, interesting myself. Uh, that is actually uh, a, a big thing. Uh, now, this generally comes from PR companies rather than startups themselves. And uh, the PR company, and I'll talk a bit more about PR companies later, but uh, the PR company, they're keen to get some press for their client, but the client hasn't got anything interesting to talk about that's new at the moment. So what they'll say is, I know, I'll contact the press and get my client to give expert analysis on a recent news story. So uh, for example, yesterday, Facebook changed the uh, guidelines for developers uh, working with their platform. Uh, so what I, I'm fully expecting in the next uh, few days to get is uh, PR companies getting in touch saying, uh, Due to the recent uh, changes to Facebook's guidelines, my client, some guy at the CEO of a company you've never heard of, would like to give his expert analysis. Generally, if we want expert analysis, we'll go and find someone. Um, if it, I don't think any of those pitches have ever worked because if you think about it, if no one's ever heard of your company, why would anyone be that interested in your expert analysis? Which is harsh, but it, it, it is kind of true. And so what I say to people like that is, much better to write a personal blog post, you know, either on your own personal blog or on your company blog that puts your point across. If your point is really, really interesting, let us know. We'll go and take a look and maybe we'll link to it. Um, and uh, then maybe we'll come to you next time. But uh, those pitches generally are kind of met with a, 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 a shrug and a click of the delete button. Uh, I actually have a bit of a, a problem with deleting pitches. I always feel a bit guilty uh, if I delete pitches. So what I tend to do, I've got a tips uncovered rejected label on, on, on Gmail. And uh, I started that in late 2010, or maybe even earlier actually, early 2010. And uh, my inbox had got to 99%, or my, my Gmail account had got to 99%. So I had to delete them recently. And I still felt guilty about deleting those uh, really bad pitches from 2010. But hey. Um, <laughs> And uh, 
pitches with no links, pitches that want me to put me in touch with their CEO before I even know what they do. Um, I said, I'd be like, oh my God, a CEO wants to talk to me. Um, <laughs> and uh, someone else followed on with, I want to give you the opportunity to talk with the CEO. No, your CEO wants an opportunity to talk with me. Cocky, but true. Um, yeah, there is this kind of, uh, kind of, Ooh, the CEO is impressive. We meet CEOs all the time. It, it's not uh, that exciting to say, we'll let you speak to the CEO. And actually, we prefer it if the CEO, him or herself, actually gets in touch with us directly because those personal relationships are actually really, really useful um, and uh, for both sides. And I'll talk about that a bit, a bit more later. And then I finished off this uh, last year by just saying, I'm screenshotting this and sticking it in my presentation. Say hello to all the lovely people at Midem. So uh, the team there saying, hi, Midem. Don't do these things, please. We want to love you. Hi, Cam. So how do you perfect your pitch based on the fact that there are all those bugbears that journalists uh, can reel off uh, within seconds of being asked about them? Uh, first thing is to keep it brief and to the point. So... Uh, what I've done earlier this year, or well, in fact earlier last year, in fact, um, I uh, decided that because I occasionally give talks like this, what I'd do is when I get really, really bad press releases, I'd label them in Gmail really bad press releases and then wheel them out at opportunities like this. Uh, part of me thinks I should probably pixelate who it's from and things like that and uh, all the personal details, but at the same time, Never mind. Uh, so uh, if you're at the back, you won't be able to read these, but uh, uh, just to show that there are real world examples of this. Now, this one isn't actually too bad. The reason I've flagged this one up uh, is that basically there's no personalization at all. Literally, it just says, editor, for immediate release, innovation expert launches mobile platform to revolutionize charitable giving. Now, press releases are all well and good, and they're really useful, and they tell us a lot about the product, and we want to read about the product, so I often use press releases as a way of uh, getting, making sure I've got all the information I need. But what really helps draw me in and helps me get interested in what's in the press release is just a brief note at the start saying, Hi, Martin. Um, We've got a new app launching, that, a new platform uh, to revolutionize charitable giving. Um, it's really exciting. It's called Give Easy, and uh, I think you'd be interested in it. Just that would probably be enough to then make me want to read the press release. Just having going straight into press release speak, which is always a bit kind of formal and a bit kind of jargony, uh, just kind of makes you think, oh, I'm going to leave that. Um, or, you know, I, at least I don't necessarily feel so excited and interested in the product uh, necessarily. Uh, <laughs> now, here we go. Now, this is where jargon really, really comes into it. Uh, this is uh, probably the most jargon-filled subject line I, I could find uh, in, in my inbox in the last uh, few months. Summit features a comprehensive, innovative, and interactive agenda addressing critical enterprise cloud computing virtualization. It's, it's so bad, it switched the microphone off. I'll start that again. Uh, Summit features a comprehensive, innovative, and interactive agenda addressing critical enterprise cloud computing virtualization and operational challenges. Ooh, that's a long subject line, and I still don't know what it means. I understand all those words, but I'm just hit by words, and uh, then it basically repeats that all the way through, uh, talking about business-to-business -business conferencing, and um, invaluable opportunities, and uh, all this uh, stuff, bandwidth management, and strategic summit, and all these words, when literally you could rewrite all of that in half the time with the same amount of information, just get rid of all the jargon. Um, there's a cloud and virtualization summit uh, taking place in South Africa on the 10th and 11th of November. Here are some bullet points about it. There we go. I mean, we wouldn't run this anyway because we don't tend to cover that many uh, events in advance. But, um, uh, you know, that would certainly at least uh, give the, uh, give the uh, email a little bit more impact. Now, this is a bit better. I'm talking about uh, keeping it brief. This does keep it brief. Makes a couple of mistakes, though. Dear, square bracket, name, close square bracket. <laughs> hey, okay, if you're going to do mail merge, make sure it works. Um, dear name uh, really makes me feel like a, a valued person to uh, be targeted with this. Um, just a quick head up. They probably mean heads up, but we'll let them off. Um, the iOS app is now available in the App Store. What iOS app? Who are you? Oh, it says in the subject line, Photogotchi pixel art uh, photo app is out. 
doesn't tell me anything about what this app is and what it does. But it does say, let me know if you have any questions, our press kit, um, and then you can download a zip file uh, to uh, get all the details. If I'm going through loads and loads of emails to find out which ones I'm going to cover, a zip file, downloading that, unzipping it, opening it, going through loads of screenshots to find the, uh, the press release, having to understand that, all of that, when you could have just had a, a three lines of text at the start of the email explaining what you do um, uh, would have been a lot better. So uh, because these emails are so important and they are the, the big way that uh, most people, um, mo most journalists get pitched and most uh, startups will pitch journalists, um, I've uh, run through um, a few mock-up examples of how not to do it and indeed how to do it. So uh, here's an example. Um, so this is another example where it just goes straight into, no, no personal introduction, just for immediate release. Instaquack launches as a superlative solo mo social local mobile solution. Instaquack TM from Cineblist TM is a genre-defining new app. It truly is the pinnacle of location-based social photography sharing for ducks and fake doctors everywhere. With this HTML5, JavaScript, and Ruby on Rails enhanced experience, feathered friends and those in white coats can experience the joy of photo sharing thanks to patented blah blah TM technology. CEO Michael X Boring Pitch, MBE, MSC, said, with Instaquack TM, the dynasty of social media is superbly emphasized using our patented blah blah trademark technology created over a six year period on a Basingstoke industrial estate. I once nearly met Mark Zuckerberg in a Palo Alto coffee shop, but my friend Dan said he'd left just before I arrived. Uh, Cineblis TM is delighted to announce that Instaquack TM is now available on popular app stores with immediate effect. So much jargon in there. I mean, uh, you know, social, local, mobile, we hear that all the time. Uh, it's, you know, there's no, no need to tell us that. Um, uh, all those trademark things, we get that a lot. I don't know why people feel the need to put trademark. You know, I, I'm going to write about your app. I don't care if it's trademarked or not. Um, and then you know, telling us what frameworks you've used to write the app and all that kind of thing. Generally, we'll ask if we're really interested, but uh, if a user isn't interested, chances are we probably won't be. And uh, those quotes, I mean, feel free to include a quote from, you know, the CEO or whoever in, in your, in your uh, press release, but generally they won't be used. Um, if we want a quote, we'll come to you one, uh, for one because uh, generally those quotes just read like they've just been written by a PR company. Um, and, uh, yeah, so, uh, so cut down on the jargon, keep it personal, keep it brief and uh, and things are a lot better. Um, th this is an example of going too personal. Hi, Martin. I hope your cold that you tweeted about a month ago has cleared up. I hate those things! Quadruple exclamation mark. Sometimes people will uh, do that. They'll, they'll look through the Twitter account the journalists are trying to pitch and they'll find something that they tweeted about ages ago or even like the day before or the same day and then bring that in. Uh, the idea being that it makes it more personal but it just sounds a bit creepy in the, in, in the perspective of a, a pitch from someone you've never heard from before. It just seems a bit weird. So, uh, yeah, uh, leave that out. Um, I wanted to see if you had in some interest in my app, Instaquack. TechCrunch, Mashable, and the Huffington Post loved it. Now I think it's time that you see it. The way they're thinking there is, because all these other sites have, have loved this app, this guy will love it too, and he'll write about it. And because the other uh, sites have covered it, that means that you know he's going to be all the more wanting to get on board and show how much he loves it. In actual fact, what we tend to think is, oh, you went to them first, did you? Because this is a big thing about, um, certainly in uh, journalists in tech, is we like to be first with things. We don't like to... F play seconds or, you know, uh, follow up on things ages later. Uh, literally, I've received a press release um, the minute something has been announced, but uh, another site got, an, uh, got it under embargo, so they got it in advance, and they've written something, and the news story goes out. Two minutes later, I get the press release. I'm like, well, it might take me half an hour, an hour to write this up, and then I look really late to the party. Um, so... Uh, I'll talk about this a bit later, but uh, um, de definitely uh, saying everyone else has covered it, now you should, isn't a good move. I know it's been covered elsewhere, but a blog like the next Read Write Web, get the name right, uh, would work wonders for our branding and SEO. 
no, don't tell us that you want coverage that works wonders for your branding and SEO. We write for our readers, not for your branding and SEO. So, uh, you know, d that may be true, but don't, don't encourage, don't put that in your pitch. It, it's not, it's not a, uh, it doesn't look very nice. Um, I'm willing to link back to you if you cover us. Gee, thanks. Um, download the 200 megabyte press pack now. And again, that does happen sometimes where rather than tell us the information in the thing or just link to a web page, <laughs> we have to download some huge file and unzip it and all of that. So this is much better. Hi, Martin. We're about to launch a startup I think you might be interested in. Instaquack is essentially Instagram for ducks and fake doctors, but it's so much more than that. I've attached more info, or you can check out the video and screenshots here. We're a new company, and we're planning to launch on Tuesday at 9 a.m. Pacific time. We'd love you to cover the app. Thanks, Michael. It's short, it's personal, it tells me a little about, uh, about what it does, but it gives me a bit, you know, it gets me excited about wanting to learn more. I can click through and find out more. Nice and simple. I'm far more likely to respond to that kind of thing than any of the emails we've seen before there. So uh, once you've got your pitch uh, prepared uh, and you've sent it off, don't pester us. Sounds like, I, I hate saying things like that. It makes you sound so rude and makes journalists sound so grouchy and horrible, uh, which maybe is true. But uh, uh, is it, yeah, don't pester us is, is literally uh, don't phone up like, five minutes later or email or tweet or direct message and say, um, did you get my pitch? Did you get my pitch? Because I might have been writing a, a post and uh, literally what happen, tends to happen is when I start writing, my e e email counter starts going up and up and up. And so at the end of when I click publish on that, go back to my email to take a look, I then have to go through everything. So it may take me half an hour, an hour to see your email. Um, it may take me several hours to reply. It may take me, it may take me a, a day to reply. Um, pestering isn't going to get anywhere. Uh, and yes, no phones. Uh, it's funny. Um, I was talking to someone who works in PR uh, last week. And uh, they were saying they couldn't understand why journalists don't like phone calls. They were like, well, surely if I phone you, you can make a call about the, you know, you can make a decision about whether you want to cover something straight from the pitch, and then we're over. It's dealt with. The problem is, it's, a, it's an attention thing. If I'm writing, if I'm concentrating on something I'm doing, a uh, phone call out of the blue, unexpected, breaks that concentration. Um, I then have to listen to the pitch. Now, the pitch may well be a lot easier to understand if it's just written or, you know, I click through to a web link uh, rather than being described. Try and, you know, try and describe, let's say you, no one had ever heard of Facebook before and you get a phone call explaining Facebook. You wouldn't be able to judge if it was good or not just from a really brief description over the phone from a PR company. You'd want to actually take a look yourself and see what it looks like and all that kind of thing. Uh, so uh, most phone calls I get from PR companies, I usually end up saying, send me the details in an email and I'll look as soon as possible just because uh, it just doesn't work. Um, and also, I try not to get my, let my phone number get out there. Uh, it doesn't always work, but uh, it's a, it's an att it, it, I certainly attempt that. Um, this is where pestering can go really badly wrong. This is one of my favorite examples. Uh, this is uh, an article from Gizmodo. How I made a 15-year-old app developer cry. Uh, this was um, a 15-year-old kid who had developed his first app. He was trying to get press coverage for it. And he was emailing lots and lots of tech press. I think we got, we, we got pitched with this as well. But um, apparently, Gizmodo really got hit bad by it. So he con contacted one guy. Guy didn't reply, so he contacted Everyone at Gizmodo, pretty much, asking if they cover this app. Uh, and then when they didn't reply immediately, contacted them again. Uh, they finally got back to him and said, well, yeah, it's quite an interesting app. We might cover it in the next few days. Next day, will you cover it, please? My boss is going to fire me if you don't cover it. He's a 15-year-old kid developing this app on his own. He's, he's, he's lying about it to try and get some, uh, <laughs> to try and pressure them into covering it as soon as possible. Um, it went on and on and on. And uh, in the end, uh, after just constant, constant um, uh, harassment, uh, I think Gizmodo ended up giving this app like worst app of the week or something simply out of spite uh, and uh, made him cry. So uh, I think he's doing, all, uh, he's doing pretty well for himself now. He's got funding and his app's doing well. Uh, but uh, yes, uh, didn't ingratiate himself with uh, the tech press early on. Uh, next up, be careful with exclusives. And I say this because some journalists will say to you, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I really like your pitch. Um, I'll cover it, but only if you 
don't let anyone else cover it. I'm the only person who can cover it. Now, that's, uh, that, you know, that's got its upsides and its downsides. Uh, the upside is media outlets love exclusives. So they'll, uh, you know, the chances are if they've got an exclusive, they'll uh, really throw their all into covering it. Uh, but the downside is uh, that media outlets hate being second. So you miss out on a lot of additional coverage. Uh, what I've had sometimes is an exclusive have been given to another site and then the, the, the exclusive goes out and then they pitch everyone else immediately. And I'm like, well, you gave it to them first. And they say, yeah, sorry, they asked for an exclusive. Like, yeah, but now we'll just look really late if we cover it. Um, and so what happens is the only person that benefits from that exclusive is the person you gave the exclusive to. And what happens if they, they rush off their feet and they, they end up writing it, rushing it, and uh, they write a really short post about uh, your, your startup and it's a bit rubbish and doesn't really have much impact? Then suddenly, rather than having pitched 10 different, uh, 10 different outlets and got six articles written about you, you've got one and uh, everyone else feels a bit kind of bad because they got left out and so they don't want to hear from you until you've got some other news in the future. Uh, so what I'd say with exclusives is if you've got something small, like a little bit of news that's uh, quite interesting but not a major move forward, sometimes it's nice to help build relationships with journalists to say to someone who you particularly like, hey, do you want this? You know, we'll just give it to you. And uh, that's nice. And we'll be like, yeah, cool, go on, go on, thanks. But if it's something major, it's like a really big deal for your company that you really want to get the word out about, um, exclusives are, are definitely uh, counterintuitive. So how do you ensure that you get coverage on a lot of sites? Uh, embargoes are a good way of doing it. Uh, the idea here, for anyone who's not familiar with a press embargo, is that you contact a bunch of journalists in advance and say, at this particular time, we are going to be announcing our new product, our new feature, we're launching, whatever. Uh, here's all the details. Uh, uh, do you agree to the embargo? Uh, before you send the details, ask them if they agree to the embargo. If they say yes, then you send them through the details. You can have a chat with them, they can interview you, all of that kind of thing. Um, journalists love embargo. Well, some, some journalists love embargo. I love in embargoes because it means I have time to uh, sit back and uh, really take my time on something and uh, really write a nice, decent article about it rather than racing against other people to, uh, uh, to cover it. Uh, so uh, that's cool. And then I can just schedule it and uh, publish it at the time when the embargo ends. Um, and uh, the upside of that is hopefully you get lots of simultaneous coverage. Uh, so anyone who follows lots of tech blogs, for example, will suddenly see your app being talked about in six different uh, tech blogs all at the same time. Um, and then obviously there are people who only read one or two of those blogs and so they'll definitely see it. And uh, you get high impact and that, that's great. Uh, the downside of embargoes is that people do break embargoes. Journalists, for a number of reasons, may publish minutes, hours, even days or a week early sometimes. It has been known. Uh, why might that happen? It can be human error. They could be writing the article in advance and accidentally click publish rather than save as draft. Um, and I've, I, did I do that once? Probably a few minutes before embargo or something, I probably clicked publish. I was like, no! It's just this horrible feeling where you see the tweet go out to 800,000 Twitter followers uh, and you're like, no! And uh, obviously, and then you get the phone call and the email, why did this go out early? Um, it, it's terrible. I've heard stories of embargoes being broken a week early because it got the, the, the press release got sent out so early that uh, the journalists got confused, you know, dealing with loads of dates. They see Monday, 5 p.m., they publish it Monday, 5 p.m., and it was actually Monday the following week. And uh, so then immediately, the thing is, when the embargo gets broken, anyone who's already written that story from another publication will probably rush to click publish as well, or will just say, you know what? You let them go first, clearly, so we're not bothering publishing. And it's a mess, and it's messy, and it's, it, it, it's embarrassing, and it, it, it's, oh, it's nasty. So, uh, yeah, embargoes have their ups and downs, but uh, I think, on balance, they're generally better uh, for, the, uh, for startups and for, for the companies wanting coverage than um, exclusives are. The other option, of course, is just to send a press release out and let the press fright it out for themselves as to who cover it, covers it as soon as possible. Um, I like that sometimes, that's quite exciting. Developing relationships. So uh, this is really, really important. Uh, if you 
develop a relationship with a, a certain um, a set of journalists. Obviously, I'm not talking about a sexual relationship. That would be unethical. But um, you know, if you, if you come up to people uh, at a conference and say hello, that's really nice. I, I, there are certain startups who I've covered for, you know, maybe months or years, and I know I, I look forward to when I see their name in my inbox because I know they're going to come to me with something valuable, something interesting that I'll want to cover. Um, and that's the thing. Keep in touch about major updates. There are some who obviously like, oh, we want to make sure that we, we keep up a relationship with this guy, and they'll send every little tiny little detail of, you know, oh yeah, we just hired some guy, or, you know, yeah, we, we got featured in the App Store or something like that. Yeah, well, that's great, but you know, congratulations, but I'm not gonna cover that as news. So, uh, but the ones that are the best are the ones who will come to me with something valuable every time they come to me. And then when they're at a conference, I'll come and say hello. If a journalist has covered you and you're in the same room as them, do make the point of coming up and saying hello if you've never met before uh, because it's just nice to put names to faces and then uh, uh, that's great for the future. I, uh, yeah, the top tip, of course, is because journalists do end up meeting lots and lots of people, I'm great with names and great with faces, not necessarily good at putting the two together. Uh, so uh, sometimes I'll get people come up to me and I kind of vaguely recognize them and they'll shake my hand and I'm like, hi, I'm trying to subtly look down at their name badge at the conference to work out who they are, but not do it with any kind of, uh, with, with not do it obviously. And then they do see me do it and they kind of feel a bit awkward and they say, we met last year, don't you remember? It's like, oh yeah. And then sometimes you just end up having a conversation with someone without having any idea who they are. So how are things? Oh, they're all right. And then you end up with nobody, nobody gets anything out of it. Uh, but so if you just say, hi, uh, this is uh, Michael from, um, uh, from Instaquack, uh, when you shake hands immediately. Yeah, I covered you last week. Hi, yeah, good to meet you. How are things? Uh, much better, much more efficient and interesting for everyone involved. So, PR. Uh, startups will often come uh, to, uh, to, well, they often come to me and, and ask, should we get a PR company? Uh, should we hire a PR company? Um, generally, I'd say most early stage startups don't need a PR company. And in fact, we prefer to deal directly with the startups themselves. It's, it's a lot more efficient. It's a, a lot more straightforward. If people are calling you, if, and Instagram's a great example here, when they were a tiny little startup, three or four people, um, they'd only been out a few days and uh, you know, attention was going through the roof, people wanted to know when there was gonna be an Android version, people wanted to know how many users they had, people wanted to interview the CEO, suddenly they had lots and lots of attention. And uh, so then a PR company is really useful because you want to be focusing on your company and your business, not answering calls from the press every five minutes. That's when hiring a PR company is useful. If you're just new, you're just trying to get a bit of attention, contacting the press yourself is much better. Um, and that is, of course, the way of building up those relationships with the press. And having a personal relationship uh, with uh, individual members of the press can be useful for CEOs, for executives within startups down the line. If you get big, it's great to know that if there's a big crisis and there's lots of attention in your company, something terrible's happened and you're in the news, you know, privacy breach, whatever, you know that there's someone you can pick up the phone to and, or drop an email to and because they know you and they've followed you from the start, they're gonna be a little bit more sympathetic to your point of view and you can probably trust that they will cover you with, you know, at least they'll at least be fair um, uh, to you, uh, give you a fair hearing, whereas you, you might not necessarily otherwise have members of the press you can trust. So uh, having those long-term relationships is really good and starting early is great. Uh, so PR companies, uh, yes. Uh, in fact, I know some of the uh, biggest PR companies in Europe who deal with uh, press, uh, talk to them, they actually turn people away. They'll say, no, you're too, too early for us. Uh, come back when you've got you know, lots of attention. That's a good, good way to go, and it's good to see that they're doing that. Um, there are a few companies that will specialize in early stage startup PR. There are occasionally good ones, but, uh, but in most cases, it is better to do it yourself. Now, beyond the startup press, uh, because I think some startups do think that uh, 
I'm mentioning the next web, I mentioned TechCrunch, whatever, it's a be all and end all. That's going to be like, yeah, that, that shows that we, we've made it, you know, that, that shows that you know, we're going somewhere. Um, generally, what happens if you get coverage in uh, a big startup blog is that the day of the mention, your, your traffic will spike, there'll be lots of interest, you might get uh, people linking to you from other stories, other, other blogs following up, and uh, you know, places like Hacker News might start talking to you, um, and uh, the, the traffic will go through the roof, and it's, uh, it's great, it looks really exciting. A couple of days later, the traffic will have slumped back down again. The number of returning users from the original uh, blog post, you know, it'll be higher than before the blog post, but it won't be as high as, uh, as you might have expected, certainly as high as the spike, the initial spike might have indicated. The reason there is that the, what you're doing with that, uh, what, with that, uh, with that coverage in the pre tech press is you're basically getting uh, a piece of news that tells your peers what you're up to. Uh, so other startups, um, investors who may be interested in, in, in uh, investing in you, and early stage adopters who love to get in there uh, uh, right at the start and try new things. Uh, so it's not about building, necessarily, about building a long-term user base from that initial press coverage. It's essentially trade press. It's getting other people in the industry aware of what you're doing. And that's, that's very valuable, that's very useful, and will tend to be the first places to cover startups. So it's great to pitch us. But when you're looking for more meaningful growth for really finding uh, a, a long-term audience, looking elsewhere uh, is, is a good idea. Uh, more mainstream press, kind of specialist press. So, for example, if you are a, a photography app, then it may be well worth approaching photography blogs, photography magazines, influ influ influential photographers, that kind of thing. Um, and uh, you will find that that way, you're more likely to uh, get those long-term audience uh, boosts. Uh, think about that example I gave about the, uh, the high school in Texas. Uh, that was a, a great example of uh, those kids probably didn't read about this app on a tech blog. They, they, you know, they probably never, most of them probably don't even read tech blogs or know what tech blogs are. They just found this app in the app store, thought, this is cool, I'm going to use this and tell my friends about it. Uh, so uh, the tech press definitely isn't the be all and end all when it comes to, uh, when it comes to, uh, when it comes to coverage. But uh, please do contact us anyway, please do pitches. We love, we love getting your pitches. Uh, right then, well, uh, I, I'm going to uh, throw things open to questions now, so uh, does anyone have anything that uh, I've not covered or anything you'd like me to, uh, uh, there's a microphone just coming to you here. Uh, thank you, uh, I'm Miguel from JoyTunes, uh, I wanted to ask, uh, when is a good time to send, uh, to send an email, like in a, in, a, in a day and also before, before you want it to be released? Um, well, in terms of time frame before release, I'd say no earlier than a week. Um, a couple of days, two or three days is a good, uh, a good amount because that gives us time to, let maybe it might take eight hours or something to get to your email and read it. And then that gives us some time to then say, kind of plan out, our, if we're planning out our week, we can go, oh yeah, well two days later, um, I, I know on Wednesday I'm going to be writing about this app, um, or at least I'm going to be giving it a look. And uh, that helps us plan out the week. And it's not too far that, that then joins a huge long list of things that uh, it gets lost in a mush. So uh, yeah, a couple of days is really good. As for time of day, really any time, uh, any time at all. Um, I mean, I, 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 it varies from journalist to journalist. Personally, I spend about an hour in the morning going through the emails that come in overnight or any that I haven't got through the day before. Uh, but then I'll keep reading email through the day. So any time, really, yeah. Also, when you're using the embargo option, two mm. or three days is enough? Uh, yeah, generally, yes, yeah. Uh, as I said, if you go over a week, then you run the risk of people getting confused and thinking it's this Monday rather than next Monday. So, uh, yeah, uh, probably about three or four days, probably you know, a, a good amount of uh, advance notice for embargo, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, yeah Josh from Mixed Genius here. So a couple questions about embargo. Um, you recommend... You recommend um, sending a sort of pre-announcement to all of the press to see whether they would agree to the embargo. Yes. Is that right? Yeah. So how much how much should you tell them in that? Um, well, it varies. Uh, generally, uh, yeah, it's a good point. Um, generally, um, a, a brief description of what you're launching um, is fine. So we're launching an app that uh, is a, a brand new approach at 
music sharing and uh, We've got uh, these exciting deals with uh, these broadcasters uh, and it's launching at five o'clock on Wednesday. That kind of thing. The, the, those kind of details would probably be enough, enough to get them interested, to make them want to say, yes, I want to hear more. And then they agree to the embargo and then, they can, and then you can send through all the details. Okay. Yeah. And um, it, would you follow the same procedure if you were using some sort of wire service? I mean, how does the embargo work with the wire service? Yeah, well, if you're using a, a wire service, all I'd do is uh, approach, obviously approach the journalists that you want to approach personally with the embargo and then schedule the, the press release to go out on the wire service at the embargo time. Um, so the, the, the wire service is kind of uh, supplementary to the, uh, to the uh, personal pitches you've made with an embargo. Um, Oh, I see. So it only goes out on the wire service at the moment, uh, the embargo. Actually. Sorry, I, I can't hear that. Um, I don't know if you can... It, so it only goes out over the wire service the moment the embargo ends. Is that how it works? Uh, yeah, well, that's the best thing, because if, if it goes out early, then that confuses everyone, and everyone's like, oh, well, the press release has gone out, so the embargo must be over, and then you get some people hitting publish, some people haven't seen it, and they get confused. So, yeah, uh, tie in the press release going out on the wire with the embargo ending, yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Hello. Hi. Oh, oh yeah. hi. Sorry. <laughs> um, you mentioned before about uh, that there are some journalists you can trust and others you can't. I just wanted to know if there are any red flags you can watch out for to be able to screen journalists early on, work out how much you can trust them. Well, I'm, I'm certainly not going to give any names of who you can trust and you can't. Um, I don't know actually about red flags. That's a, that's a really interesting question. I'm honestly not sure. Um, because, you know, I, I don't think you can tell. I think you can, that's something you can only tell through personal experience um, and through kind of, you know, gossip and, you know, asking other people about uh, people they trust. Um, going with people who maybe looking at their Twitter accounts and seeing if they, uh, you know, seeing if they're the kind of people who you, you could get on with. And then there's a certain amount of kind of. Uh, Alignment in the way of thinking is what is one way to at least uh, at least see if they seem like the kind of person who's going to do right by you But you really can't tell I don't think until you really uh, talk to them and uh, and uh, at least give them a go uh, or, or ask other people for experience. Yeah Okay, I'm sorry. I can't give you any more <laughs> and if you find that they do write something that maybe you can interpret as negative mm. Do you think you should keep going back to sending them press releases or should you just well, that, that depends. I think that if they really abuse the kind of trust that you uh, you built up through the pitching process, and you know they they publish really early when you weren't expecting it or whatever, then you may think twice. If they write something negative that is constructive and is at least you know valid and valid criticism, then they're probably well they're doing the job right, and so. I don't think you should really, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of criticism, for example, in the games industry where um, certain publishers will blacklist journalists who give negative reviews. And so it's all about encouraging nine out of tens. It's like, well, they gave that, our last game a seven out of ten. That's not good enough. Cause the scoring in the games industry is ridiculous. If it's not an eight or a nine or a ten, uh, it's seen as negative. So, um, you know, they give them a seven. We're never going to go to them again. We're blacklisting them. Doesn't tend to happen in the tech press quite as much. Um, as far as I'm aware, I've not been blacklisted by anyone. But um, really, if you think that it was negative, but it at least um, it was it was a good piece of writing, then I'd at least give them a chance again. Um, but in the end, it's up to you, really. If you, you know, it, it depends what you want out of it. Whether you you just want a, an ad or you want something that's a that's a, a constructive review. Um. <laughs> Um, a lot of startups uh, approach tech, uh, tech um, media early on in the process. Um, what's your advice? Do you think it's better to approach specific, like if you're focused on a certain genre of music, or is it, is it better to focus on industry publications first, validate your product, and then once your, your product is, once you've, you know, have product market fit, then go to, to pitch tech media? Um, well, that's certainly one way of doing it. Um, I don't think it does you necessarily any harm to go any earlier to the to the tech press, um, although it may burn certain bridges if 
we look at something and you go, like, oh, you're not sure about that. And then you keep the same name and the same product. Um, it may be a bit harder to persuade uh, the press to uh, give it a, a fair shot again later. But, I mean, certainly at the next web anyway, I think we give people a fair hearing. And um, if we turn it down once, if you come back to us six months later and say, you know, we've completely rethought the product, um, then, uh, then, then we'll certainly give it another go. In terms of, uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, do you think that, um, are you saying that we might cover it too early in terms of, and then you end up doing something completely different? Or uh, Well, I, I guess my, my, my view always around press is that, you know, you want to make sure that you maximize the coverage. Mm. So you, you want to make sure you have the best story possible. Yeah. You put your best foot, at, foot, foot at forward yeah. so that you maximize you know, the coverage. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, obviously, you want, you want to be comfortable with your product before, yeah. uh, I, I'd say, yeah, um, uh, w one of the first things I said when I, when I started um, this talk was uh, make sure you have, you know, if it's not ready for your users, it's not ready for the press. And I think that, uh, yeah, coming too early where it's, it's still a sketched out product uh, that's kind of vaguely interesting, for a start, we probably won't cover it anyway. Um, we're more likely to cover something that's fully formed and um, uh, is at least pointing towards a really great future, is a minimum viable product and uh, has use to at least some audience. And, uh, that's, uh, and we, the thing is, we'll probably come back to it later if it's interesting and then has a meaningful uh, progression and, and adds interesting features over time. Uh, that's that's get a way to get more press because then, then we're like, well, now they've added this extra feature that, that really takes the product forward and if you've not tried it before, you might want to try it now. So, uh, yeah, I think if you've got a product that you're proud of enough to put out to users, it's probably fine to go to the tech press. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, well, uh, thank you very much. I'm going to uh, hang around uh, for a bit, so uh, please do come and say hi, especially if you're a startup and you've got an app or a service you're launching or any news at Midem or anything like that, then, uh, then please come and say hello, and uh, I'd love to speak to you. Well, thank you very much. Cheers.